are listening to a special episode of Neo Cash Radio. In the studio with you, it's JJ. In this special episode, I interview co-founders of the SWAT protocol, Don Mositas and Michael Oved. The SWAT protocol presents a peer-to-peer methodology for trading ERC-20 tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. Don and Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. So I didn't read bios during the start of the intro, so why don't you take a moment and just uh, find out a little bit about each of you. Uh, Michael, can you start? Yeah, so uh, I went to Carnegie Mellon, studied math uh, shortly after, went into a small algo trading company. Uh, it was about 40 people. This was before the um, uh, financial crash, um, which is a you know very terrifying moment where uh, our effectively our, our prime broker uh, uh, went bankrupt. So it was kind of the, the my first experience towards how risky centralization was, and it kind of permanently made me a skeptic of the financial system. I was with that company for a uh, number of years. We went out and built our, our Asia business, uh, grew a lot. We uh, successfully IPO'd in 2015, took some time off, um, got really excited about Ethereum uh, in early 2016 when I met a lot of the consensus people at Further Future Music Festival and uh, got started on this project probably around September 2016. Excellent. And Don, uh, how about you? So I've uh, so I also went to, to Carnegie Mellon uh, Information Systems. Um, I've basically been working in uh, early stage kind of startup uh, ecosystem in the Bay Area um, since having graduated uh, for companies small and large. Um, I uh, my my kind of bread and butter is in uh, product uh, design and development. So I'm, I'm like a full stack engineer by trade, but really like to focus on kind of the end user experience. Um, and so my my interest in this space is uh, similar to uh, to Ovet's, but uh, you know not quite as direct. Um, he and I started talking about some of this stuff as uh, as he was working through it uh, towards the end of last year, and uh, I got I got very excited about bringing this stuff, um, you know, into the hands of uh, into the hands of everyday people. So. Well, uh, just just for a, a reference point, and we'll get right into the swap protocol. But how long ago did each of you discover crypto? Like, just sort of that that point in time. Yeah, so mine was in 2011. It was uh, actually a few emails that, that some of my more uh, tech-savvy friends were sending around talking about Bitcoin. Okay. Um, and at the time, this was before, uh, you know, the Mt. Gox debacle, and I was, I was kind of, um, I, was a, I was a skeptic. I'm naturally a skeptic, and, and, but I didn't look at the technology behind Bitcoin. Um, and then <clears throat> it took me two years after that, actually, to read the Bitcoin white paper, to, to my detriment, obviously. Right, well, the price had changed a lot. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, we started the show in 2013, and uh, before the Mount Gox stuff, so um, it was a wild beginning of our our radio career uh, covering crypto. But uh, what about you, Don? How long ago did you uh, find out about it? Sure. So um, I think I think it might have been around the same time that I actually did uh, I did get to read the the paper, the white paper um, for Bitcoin. But um, I. Uh, like being being an applications guy, um, just trying to think in terms of how this technology can be kind of brought, to, you know, brought to, to market in different ways. Um, you know, the first application, of course, is cryptocurrency. But um, for me, uh, as Ethereum started to um, come into the scene as this more kind of uh, general uh, blockchain computing platform, um, I began to be uh, able to envision applications. Um, better than I was before. And so I, I, I really started to explore it in earnest uh, maybe just a few years ago. Right. Yeah, Ethereum was definitely a game changer. Uh, so let's let's get into the swap protocol, which is built on the Ethereum blockchain. And, and let's just start with an overview. What is swap and what makes it different? Yeah, so maybe um, maybe we'll talk about kind of the or origins of the project. So yeah, so we were kind of, um, so a while ago, uh, well, sorry. So, so at my previous company, we were we were uh, you know hacking the banks essentially. We were trying to we were trying to uh, disintermediate the banks. And so that was kind of like our mission. You know, these banks are in the middle of all these trades between people, and we were kind of the little guys trying to reduce the spreads between between um, uh, uh, the retail retail and um, the exchanges. And so like, kind of that, that, the ethos of that, um, when, when I read about Ethereum, I was like, okay, well, you can essentially now rewrite all of finance in, in a decentralized uh, fashion. It was like a really cool uh, uh, moment for, for, for me. And 
so swap it's kind of, it's kind of so we you know you look at you look at uh, these these assets they're stored on a decentralized uh, uh, trading network or sorry a decentralized uh, platform and and we're like thinking about it and we're like well how do you actually trade these assets it's like they go through centralized trading systems that kind of doesn't make sense or it's just not necessary the technology is at a point where you can actually do uh, actually build an exchange that that is, uh, you know, on on either on the blockchain or communicating with the blockchain effectively in in such a way where you don't need these central parties anymore. Um, so we were kind of really thinking about how to build a decentralized exchange, and you know, with my experience with uh, uh, order books and uh, trading on hundreds of exchanges globally, and and looking into to uh, uh, the, the, mar the market microstructure of all these different exchanges, understanding all the details, and uh, we just came up with a design which we think is really well suited for the blockchain. And uh, we, you know, we published our white paper and 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 did extremely well. And you know, actually, um, last night we we announced the the our trading platform that we're building, which is called AirSwap. Oh wow! Excellent. So, yeah, very cool stuff. We've been we've been working on this. Really I've hard. been doing research and I I missed that for some reason. I I read your white paper and I I watched your videos and stuff, but I missed that announcement. This is not online yet. You oh, are okay. the first. You are the first person outside of our presentation last night to hear about it. Wow, excellent. Well, I'm honored. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we can talk if if you are willing. We can talk a little bit more about that once we get through what swap is. If that's cool. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Don, you want to take swap. Um, yeah, I, I think I think furthermore to that point um, about uh, about you know kind of how how it came to be, um, you know Oved uh, of course has a pretty deep experience in this stuff and was doing a lot of thinking um, for for a while uh, up up until kind of realizing that peer to peer was a great fit. Um, for my for my side and and you know bringing my uh, you know, I have some experience. Um, Building products for developers and thinking as a developer, um, and I think that I think that uh, designing you know uh, nice abstractions and simple APIs and, and something that's actually usable is, is important as well. Um, right. Let's you know we're trying to bring this um, into a into a world where where developers can pick it up and build, um, but also um, you know everyday everyday sort of uh, you know crypto community can can pick up our app or. Or uh, they're otherwise tired into our service and, uh, and make trades. So, all right. Um, so let's let's start out right at the beginning. Now, I, I, I've traded. I'm, I'm sure a lot of my listeners trade, and I don't know if you you gentlemen trade or not. But uh, right at the top, what sort of private information will I have to give in order to use this app? Like, do I have to give my name, my address? Do I have to verify anything? Um, and that sort of stuff. Um, so this, I mean, to this point, uh, there's there's nothing like that. You're basically operating as a, um, as a, an Ethereum address, I think, within the system. Um, as we as we develop this and, and kind of see, uh, you know, where where uh, where the future lies. Um, right. In terms of like KYC and stuff like that, uh, we'll, we'll take it as it comes. But I think for now, to this point, I think uh, it's it's definitely within the, the ethos of ethos of what we're trying to build to. Um, to enable anonymity where we're suitable, of course. Yeah, actually, there's a there's a um, if if users are trading with each other on their own balance and not through an order book, it's it's our uh, our current interpretation uh, that this is not um, subject to heavy uh, regulation. Right. So we believe that we we people won't need to do um, KYC, but you know that that. Um, and yeah. So to that to that point, actually, so the so what we're kind of um, what we're kind of providing is is services and features that actually support that kind of core one to one trade, and that one to one asset exchange is still happening between two people on Ethereum, um, and so we don't actually have a part in that. We're simply facilitating that connection and um, right, basically enabling people to find. Tokens find counterparties, figure out how to how to price them, and they make the trades themselves. Right, right. Uh, I've uh, I've watched the product demonstrations on YouTube, and I'm going to have links to those demos in the show notes at neocashradio.com, along with this audio and the blog post. 
But I'd like to step through the pieces of this protocol as it would pertain to uh, swap between peers. And uh, starting out, this uh, it you know uh, this is the iOS. It looks like an iOS sort of uh, interface that you have in these demos. And uh, the first thing to note is that this this starts out with being a wallet. Is isn't that correct? That, that you have a wallet built into the swap uh, protocol for each individual user. So um, that's that's just kind of by nature of of interacting with um, with. Ethereum, I think. Um, you or do you link a wallet to this protocol? You know, do you have a wallet somewhere else, and you tell it this is my wallet, or do you have a wallet within this protocol? That's what I'm kind of trying to figure out. Um, sure. I mean, so so if a wallet is just a mean, you know, it's uh, you're generating a, like a key pair. Sure. Um, there there are wallets that uh, that may be available that have APIs that are available for us to tap into. Um, but to, to this point, for example, in that in that uh, in that demo, you would actually either generate a key pair or, or otherwise import it, and then that that enables you to perform these transactions on your device. Right. Um, so that that's why that's why you kind of saw the the wallet functionality there. But it's not really about being a wallet. Right. It's about um, it's about um, you know finding counterparties and making trades. So sure, sure. But you you establish first. I have a wallet. I have these tokens, and I you know. For you, you know your intention to tr trade, of course. Um, the next step is the maker, and in the in the demo, the, so you, you basically say I'm interested in selling uh, X tokens for uh, X token, and you don't really list a price. Is, is that correct? Right. So you're you're basically saying I want to trade you this for that. How much you know are you willing to uh, to trade for? Okay, and the next step would be the the indexer or the part that connects the maker and the taker, and and you're uh, you're talking about this is offline. This is not on the blockchain. I'm sorry, not not it's off chain. Um, tell us a little bit about the indexer. Yeah, so the indexer we kind of see as um, like a Google for uh, tokens. So it's kind of like a search engine where Google or Craigslist, um, however you want to look at it, where you're basically able to. Um, uh, well, the, the indexer, people can post what tokens they want to trade, and other people can find those tokens that others are willing to trade. Right. And this, is it, where would this be hosted if it's not on the chain? Is it part of the app itself? Is it on the, the user's local interface? Uh, how does that work? Yeah, so uh, I think that the, the first uh, implementation of this, we're, we're probably going to run the indexer ourselves. Okay. So it will be, it will be a, you know, a centralized service, and we'll, we'll, you know, over time work to decentralize that. Right. Um, and then there's the taker, and this is the person uh, who, who, through the indexer, found the maker's initial intent to sell or trade or swap, and then the taker responds to that, uh, that intention with uh, an offer. Is that right, or, or how does that process work? Yeah. So the the so first the maker posts to the indexer, kind of advertises that they're willing to trade, and then the taker finds that that address uh, of the maker, <laughs> establishes a one to one connection with that with that maker, um, you know, through through the through finding them on the indexer, and then basically there's uh, the prices are passed directly between counterparties instead of through what people are used to, which is an order book. Right. And then the next part of this process would be the oracle. So after the the maker and the taker come up with a a, a combination of prices and tokens to be to be swapped, uh, the oracle interacts slightly to to do what? So that's that's part of the well. So when you said uh, maybe come to prices, the yeah. oracle is essentially informative in that process. And so, okay. for example, the maker is is uh, is deciding how to price. Um, an order that they would like to provide a taker, they can uh, query the oracle for you know what the oracle considers to be like an objective fair price. Um, on the other side, you know when a taker receives an order, they can they can check uh, right. they received um, to see if it's objectively uh, a fair price or within a certain um, you know percentage or range. So it's really just you know um, re we're trying to reduce the friction. When, uh, when pricing these trades, because an individual may not have direct experience with a given token or token pair. Sure. So now the Oracle is also something uh, hosted off chain. Is that something you're going to be hosting yourselves uh, initially? Yeah, I think uh, I think the first pass we're going to run we're going to run it ourselves. Um, and this is kind of 
this is kind of just uh, uh, make the pricing process less uh, less dark, you know, right. um, just so that people, are, you know, there, there's the you know, potential for bad prices to be passed between counterparties, and we just want to protect our users. Now, you've you've also in the white paper talked about incentivizing other um, other businesses, companies, people, whatever, to come up with their own Oracle service to offer competition in the marketplace as well as options. Um, I think that's a really good idea. Um, and let's just uh, let's get to the next part, the, the contract itself. And this is the only part, uh, basically, of this whole uh, transaction or this whole, I, I shouldn't say transaction, it's, it's basically uh, 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 interfacing, it's communication. Uh, the contract happens, and that's a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. Just tell us a little about that. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so you mentioned that basically to this point, it's been it's been off chain. So this is the kind of discovery and negotiation process, and then actually having um, formed an order that that uh, the maker and taker can agree on, they go to submit that to the smart contract. And this this exchange contract is based on. Um, Supporting uh, standard uh, Ethereum tokens based on ERC twenty, um, so we can, in a pretty a pretty concise way uh, in the code, actually enable this atomic swap between the balances on uh, on each kind of respective token for, for the maker and taker. Okay, and then um, I might, I guess my question is is that like the gas involved with the contract and all that is that. Um, like, I didn't notice that in the demo at all. Um, is that something that you just sort of keep behind the scenes and is sort of a, a constant value? Or, or how does that work out from a technical standpoint? So as the, I mean, the contract is, uh, is being developed and, uh, and that's, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're working on, on that as we, as we speak, actually. And we'll be deploying, you know, newer versions of that as we, as we progress. So those gas prices will change, um, you know, based on the implementation. But I think that ultimately it is a very it is a very simple um, contract in terms of the logic and operations that need to occur to to fill these trades. Um, so the gas cost uh, comparatively should be pretty low. Right, right. And then when, once they once both parties uh, see the contract and they they both agree on it, the swap happens on uh, the contract actually executes, and then the protocol that Ethereum blockchain. Uh, Basically makes it so, and then both parties get their their prescribed tokens, and everyone walks away happy. Um, now, so this whole process, you know, it, it starts out off the chain, but it's it's sort of the the back and forth uh, negotiations between two parties, and it's it this does seem a lot different than what people might be used to with using order books and placing uh, bids and asks. Um, what you know? Do you think that? Uh, this is sort of uh, the way things are going to go more often with with peer to peer. Uh, is just more one on one interactions. I think that I think that people are getting more used to this model um, through something like Shapeshift. So Shapeshift is effectively a peer to peer trade where you're facing uh, you're, the, the other the maker essentially is Shapeshift. They're creating the price for you, uh, you know, and and collecting some some fee or they're baking a fee into the price, I believe. Um, so. That's a peer-to-peer -peer connection that will that people are getting more and more familiar with. It's also similar in respect to ours, where you don't need an account and you can just, you just basically have uh, 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 you, the the tokens or coins get swapped between the two addresses. Right. So it appears to be focused on the mobile app market. Is that correct, or am I? Is it more of an API thing? So actually, um, so actually, to the to the previous point, um, you can, you know, so we've talked about this kind of one to one trade uh, activity, um, but you, you can maybe imagine like a, like a user interface that is actually um, that is actually querying for prices from multiple takers and then pulling that together, organizing by price or or amount available or something like that, and actually providing um, a UX where you can see. Different makers and different prices and different tokens and all that sort of thing. Right. I think I think um, ultimately, you know, while people may not be. Oh, actually, to the point about Shapeshift, I think it is becoming something more comfortable that people like. Um, but we can also kind of elevate it into this world where you're basically being able to browse um, by these different um, char characteristics of makers, which is pretty powerful. Um, so 
yeah, I think I think from a UX standpoint, there's a lot of cool stuff we can do. Um, it's not necessarily um, mobile centric. I think that we um, so, for example, the the first demo was was a, a native iOS app, um, and I think you know from a, from a user standpoint, like we can do some really fun stuff there. But this the second was actually um, like a mobile web app uh, within the status uh, app um, for iOS, which is which is cool. So that is actually a web based app. Um, and I think ultimately that we we just want to build kind of interfaces uh, to reach people wherever they are. Right. And web, of course, is a great way to do that. Um, but we're not necessarily tied to a tied, tied to a platform. I mean, sort of. You know, you bring up the Shapeshift, and, and nowadays many wallets are integrating Shapeshift. I mean, do you see a future where wallets are also integrating Swap? That's the plan. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, it makes sense. It really does. And and. Um, so uh, let's just keep keep focused here. Uh, one of your demos uh, shows the swap protocol viewed inside Status. How is the user experience different between the app and the Status network? Is there a, a big disparity there, or uh, just sort of explain that? Um, when you say difference between the app and Status network, um, you... like viewing the the, the two de the two different demos that we all have links to on neocashreader.com, I mean they right. they're, they look drastically different. Uh, the the UI actually so. That's sort of what I'm getting at. So uh, yeah, so I mean, ultimately, these are these are sort of demonstrations. Okay. Or, these are these are kind of like visions of you know how we how we see these things possibly kind of developing from a user standpoint. Okay. The idea is that we you know we've designed this this uh, this protocol that actually is very flexible and um, implementation agnostic in a lot of ways. But we wanted to kind of bring something visual uh, to the table for people to kind of be able to see what this is going to feel like. Um, and so the, the first demo was just kind of a fun, simple demo of just that basic one-to-one -one kind of trading activity. But the second one was uh, a bit more of an expansion into um, like more of like a storefront kind of experience where you can browse multiple tokens, um, you can get quotes, which was a new feature in the protocol at that time, and, uh, and have this more of a, you know, kind of a storefront experience as opposed to like a one-to-one -one kind of experience. Um, All right. Yeah. Further, further beyond that, um, we, we definitely envision environments and, and uh, implementations that will facilitate things like broader marketplaces where you're interacting um, you know, between uh, many people to many people and, uh, and even uh, things like auctions, which uh, we think will be power very powerful. Uh, Obed has uh, some pretty exciting ideas there as well. So, Cool. Um, the next topic is funding. Uh, I know well that having a donation-based funding model often results in nearly no funding. Um, so you you have to handle that aspect. Tell us about the the token and uh, that sort of funding model that you're looking at. Yeah, so um, we, we wanted to design uh, our platform in a way where we're not collecting fees from users, uh, because that kind of goes against the ethos of peer to peer. I think if you have uh, a peer to peer trading network and you have a third party kind of extracting rent from the system. That's um, you know maybe maybe not what peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer was really meant to be. Um, so uh, we we designed our token, which uh, will access the AirSwap platform. Uh, the token is called Air. Okay. And uh, it is being launched on October tenth, two thousand seventeen. And wow. Air is essentially a membership token. It's a seat at the exchange, and by holding Air, you have access to our platform. Wow. This is all new information, isn't it? Yes, it is. Excellent. Um, so, yeah, the uh, the holding the token, it's sort of like as uh, the, I guess the white paper describes it as a license. Uh, you're, you're saying member. Um, are you adjusting? Are you changing the way you're describing it? Or no, I think they're I think yeah. they're pretty similar. It's like a license that's uh, tradable, I guess. Yeah. When we when we talk, you know, we talked about talk about people. Uh, sorry, talk to people about this. I think the term membership is is friendly. Uh, license is, is kind of uh, you know a little stuffy, um, yeah. but I think, I think it works in both cases for sure. It's just a matter of you know terminology. And so there's this, there, uh, the idea is is that you have to you have a you're going to be holding a certain amount of air in order to uh, access the platform, and there's this minimum amount. And of course, as the uh, the value of air changes, that minimum amount will be adjusted accordingly. Um, do you have a number for the like like a dollar amount for how much you want for this membership? Yeah, we want it to be about ten U.S. dollars, equivalent to about ten U.S. dollars. Oh, that's pretty fair. 
And, then, and that's basically just held. I mean, the, the wallet address that's using this platform has this token, at least $10 worth in the address or, you know, in their collection of tokens. And then you you don't lose it, right? It's, it's basically you just have to have possession of it. That's correct. Um, that's kind of the baseline model we're going with, that you have to hold it. And then <clears throat> there might be certain premium features on our platform that we'll consider. Uh, I mean, we'll consider this later on. Right. Uh, but the, the air balance may change according to certain premium features that the user subscribes to. Okay, so you're, you mentioned the plans for the token sale. Uh, will the product launch happen after the sale is concluded? Or what's, I mean, I know it's in beta right now, and you, uh, last I heard, you were full of beta testers, although I don't know if there's room at the moment. But when's like the product going from beta uh, into, I mean, the next phase? We'll, we'll make room for you, JJ, and yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, people people reach out to us directly. Well, you know, people want to be engaged with this. Um, we we'll definitely make room for them. Um, but so basically, we plan on launching Air through our own platform. Um, we this we plan on not having this just be a crowd sale contract. We want it to actually interface with our software. Oh wow! That will happen on October tenth. Um, that won't be the full uh, Air Swap platform. Um, it'll only be a very uh, tiny subset of it and um, we plan on launching airswap uh, subsequently okay and then the details of this token sale are available at swap.tech is that right swap.tech for now um, we're going to be uh, launching airswap.io uh, probably today simple version of it today and you know flush it out a little bit more over the next couple weeks and would you prefer uh, that address to swap.tech Good question. I, I like both. Um, I think we start with, with swap.tech is more. Yeah, swap.tech okay. is, is a little, is, is probably better at this point. Yeah. yeah. Right. All right. Uh, in some of the material I've read, scaling is brought up and seeing as most of what occurs in swap happens off chain. Um, actually, I got one quick question to follow up on the funding. I'm sorry, I missed it. Um, cool. What's like, what's your funding goal? What's, what's sort of the number you're looking for that you, you think you would be able to then continue developing and really flesh out some of these ideas? Yeah, so we, um, you know, because it's a membership token, we don't want to just flood the market with these. So we plan on selling at only a percentage, uh, you know, maybe five to 10 percent uh, of, our, of our tokens out of the gate. <clears throat> um, that's that, that we haven't announced that number or, or fully, uh, I guess, f finalized that number. We're still working on it. But um, you know we don't we're not trying to we're not trying to do like a, a really huge token launch. Um, we don't think that's necessary at this point to, to develop the platform. Right. Um, okay. So let's get back to the scaling question. Um, as I said, most of what happens off blo the blockchain, and then it's really just the contract. Uh, have you done any stress tests? Have you tried to get a lot of people to use it all at once during the beta? So that's, I mean, that's kind of what we're, we're undergoing now um, as, we, as we start to develop this stuff. Um, an, an important part of this process is definitely uh, testing it um, and stress testing it. Um, and so, and yes, and, and that's, that's a big reason to have uh, kind of pulled in uh, beta testers so we can, you know, perform uh, dry runs on some of our tech um, and otherwise, uh, you know, make sure that this is going to be ready for the, for the scale that's required when we actually launch. Um, but I think ultimately we're, we're in a pretty good place there because we have kind of have control over that um, as opposed to, you know, like a, like a crowd sale contract where people are just like um, just going at, at the same time and end up paying exorbitant fees and things like that. Right. So we, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're in a good place, I think, from the design of the token launch, but otherwise certainly um, are, are doing um, um, as much testing as we can. Yeah. Yeah. And to talk, to talk a little bit about the scalability of, of the platform itself, I just wanted to go into that a little bit. Um, so in, in order books, because uh, in order book designs, because they're public, uh, placing orders and canceling orders becomes a very regular occur occurrence because you don't know if you, you're just, there's basically this public location, you place an order, you don't know if it's going to get executed or not. So you might have to cancel it later on. <clears throat> in, in the case of, of the swap protocol, you essentially have orders that are being passed directly between makers and takers. A taker is only going to request an order from a specific counterparty if they're, you know, pretty sure that they want to execute that. And so we, our thesis is that cancels are not going to become a huge regular occurrence. And so that, that allows this, this platform to be a lot more scalable. 
Yeah, the fact that the maker isn't listing a price means that it's evergreen, right? You can always negotiate this as long as that person is still willing to trade the tokens. Um, so I think that really helps, you know, back up what you're saying is there are less cancels. Yeah. Um, would you say this is more like uh, fair to fair to compare it to more like Craigslist than say like Ether Delta? Like, yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> I think it's more. I think it's more of a Craigslist model. It's also more of an eBay model. Um, so, yeah. So so it's it's these are these are peer to peer uh, connections. You basically advertise what you want to do. Like on Craigslist, you want to sell your couch or whatever, and then people come to you, they see you want to sell your couch and they submit their bids and you negotiate on the price and then, and then you execute. Yep. And it's our, it's our thesis also that, uh, th this, this works much better than order books for, um, liquid assets. And so, uh, you know, it, it's also our, our thesis that, there, you know, there are thousands of these, there's going to be thousands of these tokens and not all of them are going to be well suited for order books. Order books are really well suited for highly liquid, highly tradable assets. But if something's only trading 10 to 20 times a day, that's probably not going to work on an order book. Right. Uh, right. How, how difficult will it be to keep on top of adding new tokens? Good question. Yeah, so I mean, you know, initially we're, we're basically standards compliant. So the theory is that any ERC-20 token um, could be exchanged for a contract. Um, I think that ultimately when we are providing services uh, and, um, you know, like basically facilitating these, this, this trading activity, um, we're going to have to be in a place where there is some, uh, you know, we're going to be taking a closer look at some of these tokens and having to, to whitelist or, or blacklist certain things based on, you know, um, whether we've kind of deemed them to be like, <laughs> like uh, risky or, or not or being classified in certain ways by uh, regulators, things like that. Right. I think there's going to have to be some discretion someday. Right. But initially, you know, we really are pretty happy with uh, with being able to take advantage of, of uh, the kind of Ethereum token standard uh, and building our uh, contract around that. So. Yeah, and it's also, um, uh, you know, we're, we're a consensus project and uh, we, ha we have a decent amount of, um, of uh, resources there to help us uh, go through these tokens and decide which ones we can, we can whitelist and which ones we shouldn't. Right. right. Um, what's it like to work at consensus? Um, consent, I mean, you know, Joe Lubin is, is a visionary and he's, he's a great guy and uh, we, we have a lot of fun working with them. Um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of different projects going on. A lot, you know, they're, they're covering everything, uh, you know, everything from in the enterprise space, uh, in the government space, and then a lot of the consumer focusing space. So um, <clears throat> there's just a lot going on <clears throat> and it's, it's, um, it's something that uh, you know, if you if you're an entrepreneur, you need to you need to know how to uh, navigate uh, and and but you know overall, it's been an extremely positive experience. They they uh, are growing a, a you know a decentralized uh, empire. It's really really cool. Yeah. Um, so I got just a couple quick questions here. Um, you, you we'll talk about the long term plans about the. Uh, the air swap just a second um my my trading experience just just briefly um you know using the order books and going to some of these exchanges one there's a lot of zombies there's a lot of uh, there's a, a lack of activity and whatnot the other problem i have is a lot of small bids and asks it's like there there are a few tokens for for you know a fraction of ethereum and then when you want to move larger amounts on, on some of these order books, you're basically at the whim of whether or not someone feels like filling it. Um, and that's, so it's, it's a, been a frustrating experience. Um, now, yeah. the swap, you don't, you don't have any limits in place at the moment. You don't have any sort of, uh, that I'm aware of, so that you could ostensibly, uh, if I wanted to move, you know, 10,000 tokens, it wouldn't be as tedious and difficult as using some of these exchanges. Is that, is that about right? Yeah. So, um, the, so just the, that, that, that everything you say hundred percent makes sense. You, yeah. So just so you know, uh, I'm sure you maybe know this, but on wall street, all the, all the big block trading, it doesn't happen on exchanges. Um, that, that when you're trying to move big size, if you try to place that on an exchange, you're just going to terrify the entire market. Cause you're basically showing your hand to, right. the, to all the players and, and all, all the other prices move. It just becomes chaos. Um, all, all, you know, all algorithms get triggered, stuff like that. 
So um, a lot of these big block trades are actually handled peer to peer. Essentially, they're handled uh, 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 between uh, market maker and uh, in institution or whoever whoever wants to do that big trade. And um, the reason why uh, the reason why market make both takers and makers prefer it. Uh, makers they they don't want to um, they, they they're able to make really tight prices. To if it's not public, but once it becomes public and you give that information to the to the to the rest of the market, then your your uh, order making information becomes something that other people can act on. And so it's it's actually not surprising to me at all that um, in in a lot of these illiquid pairs. So you kind of said two things. You said one in the illiquid, they're, they're low liquidity, and the other th in, in some of these pairs. And the other thing is that the the um, the block trading and so we, we talked about the block trading the um, the other thing in, in things that have low liquidity like for example for example like uh, for, uh, foreign exchange or uh, penny stocks in the US these actually trade peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer as well and um, the reason the reason is also for the same thing it's basically if you don't have market makers if you don't have a lot of trading happening on on these pairs uh, it doesn't make sense to just constantly place prices um, because you're, you're, you have all the risk and none of the reward. You're basically placing these, these orders and, and informing the market about what they can do without getting any of the benefit of um, actually trading. Right. Yeah, and then of course the the then I'm like, okay, well then I guess I'll use Shapeshift, but then I run into the two thousand dollar limit. And so I, you know, if I want to make a big, as you say, a big block trade, I'm I'm doing, uh, you know, five or six trades on Shapeshift, and it's like, okay, each one I'm waiting for. I want to make sure it gets through, and then I, you know, I might got to make sure I don't do a fat finger. And uh, I think honestly that people who want to move big block trades, this this platform looks like it's going to offer a lot of uh, a lot of movement without friction. So, um, it's, I mean, that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that my look is like. Yeah, small small time trades can all day long, but it's the big trades that you want to find that 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 person out there. You want to get past all the centralized tape and uh, yeah. Know, yeah, all that stuff. Privacy privacy is very important in uh, in markets, and um, you know th these markets are new. The 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 crypto markets are new ish. I mean, at least the trading platforms, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve this for customers and just have a really great experience. And I think that you know the the, the block block trading, uh, what, what you're talking about is definitely something that this, this market needs more mature versions of. So let's talk about AirSwap here and we'll finish up this, the show with, with that, uh, and that news and announcement. What's, what, what is that? What is going on with that? Sure. So, um, so we basically, we published our white paper in, uh, I believe early May. Um, and that was, that was our first kind of cut at the design of this, this peer to peer or what, what would be a peer-to-peer -peer trading uh, ecosystem. And, uh, and so basically, you know, we're taking um, feedback and, and discuss, uh, discussing the, the design and the idea with lots of people in the community to, to, uh, to great response. Issued a new uh, version of it, like maybe the, the following month or so. And, uh, and essentially, through that process, you know, validated a lot of these ideas um, and then decided uh, that we uh, would actually go ahead and implement this. As, uh, as kind of the premier implementation of the swap protocol. And so the idea is to take this, this protocol, offer it as a platform, uh, and uh, basically bring this thing to life. Excellent. Excellent. And then uh, October 10th, is that the date? Yeah, Air 1010. Air 1010. Got it. There it is. Awesome. Well, it's, it's exciting to, uh, to hear this progress and exciting to hear the latest news, too. And we'll definitely uh, have the information on neocashradio.com blog to link over to your website, and people can uh, stay tuned there and find out what's happening next. Awesome, JJ. We, we had a lot of fun talking to you. It's really awesome. Thanks so much for joining me. All right, Thanks, thank JJ. You. Have a good one. Cheers. You're listening to Neo Cash Radio. We discuss the future of money today. Tune in every Wednesday for more Neo Cash Radio. Neocashradio.com.